Good evening, brethren and sisters. Um, I'd like to welcome you all here this evening to our Wednesday night Bible class. Um, we're going to have a brother Ben Derricky um, give us his introductory talk this evening on uh, the book of Nahum. Uh, he's specifically going to look at the uh, historical context and give us give us some details in that regard. All right, so we're going to open our um, evening with him in prayer, him 114. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do approach before you in prayer at this time as we commence our evenings together to thank you for your many blessings, for the opportunity that you have given us in this troubled world in which we see your hand manipulating the affairs in the countdown to your son's return. We thank you that we have this opportunity still in a land of peace and safety to draw aside and to study your word to fill our lamps with the oil of that word, with the knowledge of you and of your son. We do ask you'll be with us this evening and bless those who are going to impart knowledge from your word. And may we, the hearers, be, be able to accept that knowledge and be able to uh, have an influence our lives as we walk towards your kingdom. We leave this meeting now in your care and approach you through the name of your Son and our Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So as an, as an introduction to Ben's class this evening, he's asked that we read from Nahum chapter 3. page 1134 for those of you a bit like me have trouble finding it <clears throat> Nahum chapter 3 woe to the city of blood it is all full of lies and robbery 
the prey departeth not. The noise of a whip and the noise of the rattling of the wheels and of the prancing horses and of the jumping chariots. The horseman lifteth up both the bright sword and the glittering spear. And there is a multitude of slain and a great number of carcasses. And there is none end of their corpses. They stumble upon their corpses because of the multitude of whoredoms of the well-favoured harlot, the mistress of witchcrafts, that selleth nations through her whoredoms and families through her witchcrafts. Behold, I am against thee, saith Yahweh of armies, and I will discover thy skirts upon thy face, and I will show the nations thy nakedness and the kingdoms thy shame. And I will cast abominable filth upon thee and make thee vile and will set thee as a gazing stock. And it shall come to pass that all they that look upon thee shall flee from thee and say, Nineveh is laid waste. Who will bemoan her? Whence shall I seek comforters for thee? Art thou better than populous No, that was situate among the rivers, that had the waters round about it, whose rampart was the sea, and her walls were from the sea? Ethiopia and Egypt were her strength, and it was infinite. Put and Lubim were thy helpers. Yet was she carried away. She went into captivity. Her young children also were dashed in pieces at the tops of all the streets, and they cast lots for her honourable men, and for all her and all her great men were bound in chains. Thou also shall be drunken, thou shalt be hid, thou also shall seek strength because of the enemy. All thy strongholds shall be like fig trees with the first ripe figs. If they be shaken, they shall even fall into the mouth of the eater. Behold, thy people in the midst of thee are women. The gates of thy land shall be set wide, wide open unto thine enemies. The fire shall devour thy bars. Draw thee waters for the siege. Fortify thy strongholds. Go into clay and tread the mortar. Make strong the brick kiln. There shall the fire devour thee. The sword shall cut thee off. It shall eat thee up like the canker worm. Make thyself many as the canker worm. Make thyself many as the locusts. Thou hast multiplied thy merchants above the stars of heaven. The canker worm spoileth and fleeth away. Thy crown are as the locusts, and thy captains as the great grasshoppers, which camp in the hedges in the cold day. But when the sun ariseth, they flee away, and their place is not known where they are. Thy shepherds slumber, O king of Assyria. Thy noble shall dwell in the dust. Thy people is scattered upon the mountains, and no man gathereth them. There is no healing of thy bruise. Thy wound is grievous. All that hear the brute of thee shall clap the hands over thee. For upon whom hath, for upon whom hath not thy wickedness passed continually? So with that cryptic chapter as an introduction, we'll ask Ben to come forth. Thanks, Tim. Good evening, everybody. I think um, Tim's comment there about finding Nahum was one of the reasons why I actually decided to have a look into it, because it's like the minor prophets most of the prophets to be honest from my side of things are pretty in, unintelligible if that's the right word They're difficult to read and the minor prophets are, are the same or not necessarily the same I just I always gravitate to the New Testament I look through our last through uh, our last couple of years of, um, of Bible classes uh, and most of them has pretty much been focused on New Testament type topics um, and I think in general because the New Testament is easier, um, and less complex um, to, to digest and to read in particular and to talk about, we tend to focus um, on those sort of books. Um, and so it started off quite a, a journey for me um, in many ways, and I, I'm a bit surprised of, of where it's brought me um, going through this study um, because I've found it 
um, immensely encouraging from just from purely from a historical point of view. So I'm a um, I'm a I'm an evidence based guy. Um, I think probably a lot of my generation is. You know, you make a statement, show me the proof to back it up, sort of thing. Um, we test a lot of things, and so um, when I came to Nam and saw the amount of um, and, and Nineveh in particular and the Assyrian Empire, saw the amount of history that there is there. Um, it was really enlightening for me and, and probably a lot of you older people um, who are here are, are probably f very familiar with it, possibly very familiar with it. Um, but I certainly wasn't. Uh, this ancient history has never really been my jam. So um, f just uncovering this was, 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 was fascinating. Um, going through the book of Nahum in general was quite, you know, it was quite revealing. I, I didn't really know what it was about. Like Tim said, it's quite cryptic um, in some ways, but it's actually very poetic. Um, and um, once you start to generate a bit of an understanding of it, then um, it, it starts to make a lot more sense. And, um, and also just the, um, there are some really fascinating faith-based lessons that come out of it, just about the way history works and the way God works through history and God's prophecies uh, and things, uh, you know, those sort of things. And so um, th that has really sort of been, been quite enlightening for me. Um, and so I'm, I'm really glad I decided to start having a look at it um, and take it on. And, and those three areas um, that I, I just talked about uh, are, is the way we're actually going to break up. I'm going to break up these three studies. So tonight is going to be a lot of history, a lot of archaeology, uh, and a lot of context setting to see what would happened in the lead up and what forced God to work through Nahum to deliver this prophecy about um, the destruction of Nineveh and why that was the case as well. So we're going to, it's going to be quite a history lesson. We're going to go back over those, one of the, uh, going to go back over those things and, and, and pull them all out. Um, and this period of history as well is incredible because of this, there's just a fascinating intersection between archaeological evidence and biblical history. So often there's a lot of biblical history which it doesn't have archaeological evidence, it's hard to find, but through this period of the Assyrian Empire, particularly the latter end of the Assyrian Empire through Kings and Chronicles, um, it's incredible the amount um, of intersection that occurs and that, for me, you know, a bit evidential, um, I guess. Um, <clears throat> but there's, there's a lot of that that comes out. So that's what we're going to be looking at tonight. The, the why and... Um, why Nahum was sent to uh, or wrote this and was sent to Nineveh poten uh, potentially. We don't know if he actually did and it doesn't actually say, um, but assume he did. Um, and and um, what happened in, in the lead up to that prophecy being delivered. In the second session, we'll be pulling apart um, the text a bit. So we'll do a little bit of um, immersion into the text tonight, but not so much. But next, uh, in a fortnight's time, is when we'll start pulling the text apart a bit more. And, and there's a lot of detail in it. And as, I, I'm never going to be a verse-by-verse -verse sort of person, so we're not going to have that sort of overview of it. It's going to be a one night, maybe one and a bit night, depends on how carried away I get. Um, night looking at some of the real, um, uh, some of the things that come out of, of Nahum. Um, there's, there's a significant number of connections with Jonah, uh, which you might expect. And that's why um, when I was doing a bit of research, I was doing a bit of YouTubing and having a look at some ancient history and came across this uh, um, write-up that talked about the um, Nahum being the sequel to Jonah. And I thought, yeah, that actually works. Like Jonah's a, it's a there's a lot of story and it sort of builds up to, yes, the, uh, the city of Nineveh is saved. Um, and, you know, a lot of sequels are the bigger crescendo to the story, if, you know, the second book. Um, of, a, of a novel or the second second movie. I'm worried that my password's going to come back. Uh, my, um, what's the name, pay? Uh, I can't control when my screensaver comes on. So that's what was happening in the reading. My screensaver started coming on and that's why it flicked to the screen if you saw it. So I'm a little bit worried until I start going through those slides. Um, that was going to come back on. That's why I keep looking back. Um, so, uh, and, 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 um, the, the, the story of Nahum and the outcome of Nahum is all of that and more. Uh, like it, it is just such the, the, the end of the Assyrian Empire occurred through the destruction of Nineveh. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's incredible on a global scale at that particular point in time. And finally, in the last session in, a, in four weeks' time, 
God willing, we're going to have a look through the relevance of this two and a half thousand year old prophecy. You know, what can we get out of it? What are some of the encouraging lessons that come out of it for us and the reminders about God's involvement in history um, and God's redemption of his people, uh, which is what um, part of this story is all about. So that's the plan for, for the next few weeks. Um, choose your, uh, your sessions accordingly. Um, but tonight, we cho I chose chapter three to start excuse me, because um, this is the primary chapter, the primary section which helps with the dating of the book. Um, and so once, once we've had a look at this, we'll, I'll show you, show you how, how we can work out roughly um, the dating um, of the book. And then we want to go back and have a look what happened in the lead up to, to that book, once we know the, the period that it, was, um, it must have been written through, um, and really get some insight into why this prophecy was written. Um, and what it must have meant to the believers who heard this, you know, who heard this prophecy from Nahum when they saw what was going around, uh, going on around them, what they saw, you know, with the Assyrian Empire coming down, knowing that it was inevitable, or believing at least in it, that it was inevitable at some point that they were either going to end up in some foreign country or with their heads on a stake outside of the city that they lived in. <clears throat> so um, we'll, we'll cover that context um, over tonight. So firstly, let's have a look at, um, in verse 7 of, of chapter 3, uh, it says, It shall come to pass that all who look upon you will flee from you and say, Nineveh is laid waste. I'm reading from the New King James tonight. Who will bemoan her? Where shall I seek comfort for you? So the first step is that we know that Nineveh, this is a prophecy about the fall of Nineveh. And the fall of Nineveh has not yet occurred. It's saying, you know, this is the burden of Nineveh at the start of chapter one, it says, and this is saying, this is what's going to happen. You will fall Nineveh. So we know from history that Nineveh fell around 615 BC. So we know now that this prophecy has to occur somewhere before 615 BC because if it was after that, then it would be writing retrospectively, which kind of removes the whole point of Bible prophecy. So we've got, a, and all these figures are circa. Every, every date that I put in here is circa because everyone's got their opinions on, on where things actually fit, but these are all you know, in, the, in that rough period, whether it's five years this way or five years that way. So we've got a, we've got a, we've got a date where it has to be finished. This is the, the one bookend. Now come over and let's have a look at um, verse eight. <clears throat> are you better than no Ammon? Or I think the King James has, where are we? Um, than that populous no. Uh, so that is, the, that is Thebes. That's the city of Thebes in Egypt. Um, my King James slash New King James um, book has that in the margin. You, yours might have too, I'm not sure. But uh, Thebes is what I'm going to call it for the rest of the night when I refer to it. Um, and that's, that's the name that we go by. So are you better than Thebes that was situated by the river, Nile, that had the water around her, whose rampart was the sea, whose wall was the sea? So here we have a comparison. The prophet is saying to Nineveh, are you any better than this country here, this city here that's already fallen, right? Are you any better than Thebes? Thebes has fallen. You're no better than that. So this prophecy has to have been written after Thebes fell, okay? So here we have the two bookends of where the prophecy must fit. It's got to be before the fall of Nineveh and after the fall of Thebes, somewhere in there, based on, on the, what these verses say. Um, and like, like I said there, uh, like I have there, Thebes fell around 663 BC. Uh, and we know that because um, Asher, uh, who was Asher Banipal, who took Thebes, left us a nice historical cylinder um, with some writing on it, which told us that this city, the whole of it, um, I conquered it with the help of Asher and Ishtar. Silver, gold, precious stones, all the wealth of the palace, rich cloth, precious linen, great horses, supervising men and women, two obelisks of splendid electrum, weighing two and a half thousand talents. 
The doors of the temple I tore off from their bases and I carried them off to Assyria. With this weighty booty, I left Thebes against Egypt and Cush. I have lifted my spear and shown my power. With full hands, I have returned to Nineveh in good health. Um, and so, uh, you know, we've got all direct connections almost straight away there with this, um, with this verse 8, haven't we? We've got the taking of Thebes. We've got the, the aggressor coming from Nineveh and going back to Nineveh. Um, and we've got the reference to Egypt um, having the spear lifted. And, and in verse um, 9 there, it says Ethiopia and Egypt were her strength. And so, so straight away, um, uh, we can see that intersection of, of history, uh, of biblical history and archaeology um, combining and, and giving us some, some real encouragement along the way. Um, so that's how we know when uh, um, Thebes fell. Uh, and so just those couple of verses there, verse 7, um, seven to 10 almost, gives us the two bookends um, roughly of when the, the book of Nahum was written. So in that period between... Um, 663 BC through to 615 BC. So what happened in the lead up to that? Well, let's start with a brief synopsis of the Assyrian Empire. Um, the Assyrian Empire went for a significant number of years, started off quite small, as you can see in the red, and over time um, expanded to this is the breadth of the, uh, of the territory that it covered. Um, in modern day terms, down on the Persian Gulf there on the right, we're going up through Iraq um, into um, the top there around, let's call it Iratu, that will be my pronunciation up the top. We're getting into Southern Turkey there. Then we're coming down through Syria, through um, Lebanon, um, down through Israel, and then down through Egypt. And we can see Thebes down the bottom there, no Ammon. Um, the, the territory which was conquered by um, Ashurbanipal. <clears throat> and so um, this is, it, it covered a significant amount of territory um, at, at the end of its days. And it seems to be, and I'm, again, like I said, history has never really been my thing. When you start expanding yourself and covering too much territory, um, history, from what I understand, uh, tends to repeat itself where eventually it just becomes too hard to manage. You've got people spread across the empire. Your supply lines are difficult to manage. You start getting little outbreaks of um, uh, rebellion um, occurring and then which one are we going to tackle? Uh, and so that was one of the things which um, eventually led to the downfall uh, of Assyria, of the Assyrian empire. But at its peak, it, it covered um, around uh, a significant amount of territory, as you can see, most of the Middle East. Uh, and it was about 740 BC under Tiglath-Pileser III where Assyria's foray down into um, Israel commenced. And so we're going to pick that up, coming back to 2 Kings chapter 15. Now, I did cover some of this in my exhort back in March-ish, I think it was, but I'm relying on the fact that most of you probably didn't even remember that I exhorted in March. Um, and i I would certainly think most of you, I could probably actually pick out a couple who would remember what I talked about, but most of you probably don't remember um, what I covered. Um, but tonight I can go into it in a bit more detail. I can put it on a map. I can show you what it is. I can show you what the Assyrian army was like as they came down. I can create a bit more of a picture of the terror that they created. Um, and so we're going to go into it in a bit more detail um, tonight. Um, so in 740 BC, 2nd of Kings 15, and we pick it up um, in verse 19. Pull, the king of Assyria. Now, if, uh, again, this is not in your margin, uh, it might be in your inspired margin, um, but Pull is Tiglath-Pileser III. So Tiglath-Pileser III, king of Assyria, came against the land, and Menahem gave Tiglath-Pileser III a 1,000 talents, of silver, that his hand might be with him to strengthen the kingdom under his control. And Menahem exacted that money from Israel, from all the very wealthy, from every man, 50 shekels of silver, to give back to the king of Assyria. So the king of Assyria turned back and did not stay in the land. So we, here we have the first 
record, biblically recorded at least, sojourn um, of the empire starting to make its way south down into the land of Israel, what's now Israel, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and the, uh, the tribute there is, is, um, is taken from, uh, from Samaria. Um, and, and we know that this occurred as well, not only because it's written there, but thankfully Tiglath-Pileser III left us a diary note about his tributes uh, that he received. So he noted that he received, and I'm only going to, it's going to be hard enough to read the names of the cities, so I've highlighted them, and they're what I'm going to read. Um, I highlight, uh, I received tribute from uh, Comagene, Damascus, our um, previously referenced king of Israel, Menahem of Assyria, of, of Samaria, um, Tyre, Byblos, Q, uh, Carchemish, Hamath, and, and so on. Uh, and so um, we can get a picture of, of the area that they're, that they're controlling there because if I come back up to this map here, um, so that Comagene one is um, sort of southeastern Turkey, just up from Aleppo. I don't have a laser, I'm sorry, but let's say Cyprus is pointing in the right direction um, to, to take you up to where the, the Comagene was. Um, Hamath is in Syria. Um, we've got Tyre um, down there just below Sidon on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, um, is, was mentioned. Um, Byblos is in Lebanon, just above Sidon and, and just in off the coast a bit. Uh, and so we can see it's that sort of top um, northwestern corner that, uh, um, uh, that um, what was his name? The king, um, Tiglath-Pileser III, that the king is, uh, is, is sort of bringing under his control and exacting his tribute from. Um, and to a certain extent, for the Assyrians to, um, to exert their control and to get that uh, fear and eventually generate that tribute out of the uh, out of the nations wasn't particularly difficult because the Assyrians Assyrian military was known for their incredibly barbaric conquests and their violent and incredibly graphic messages that they left out the front of the cities they took um, to be communicated to their enemies people that they were going to come up against in the future to the vassal states um, and just as for any refugees who ha happened to flee to make sure they passed the story on um, of the horrors that they saw when their city was taken. And so thankfully for us, um, and if you've been to the, um, uh, the, the British Museum, you would have seen this and probably been incredibly excited because it was, I found it exciting to see and that was before I, I've done this study. So next time I go back, it's going to be awesome. Um, thankfully, they left a lot of... Um, stone reliefs and, and things like that, which document their his, historical battles. So what they did with their historical battles, with their battles is they, they had the equivalent of foreign correspondents who would go out to the battle and they would write down the things that they saw. And then they'd come back and then they'd talk to the, the artists or whoever it was, and they'd chip a, a recollection or a drawing of what that conquest was like in memory of it. And it's all part of this Assyrian drive to document things like the kings documented, you know, their conquests and their diaries. And they wanted this up and they had this up in their palaces and their temples as a celebration of how awesome they were as a country and of, of their conquests. And so you can see here a little bit about what they've got. You've got that um, Doctor Who like battering ram uh, in the middle. It's armored. It's in there, it's knocking down the, the walls. It's, it's sheltered from the, from the arrows and the rocks of the people around them. And so that was one of the ways that, that, um, that would help with their conquests of cities. This one here, I suspect is not gonna be, oh, it's actually not too bad. Um, on my computer screen, it's not so visible. But this is, the, um, this is actually the conquest of Thebes. So this was the, the drawing of the conquest of Thebes. Um, and you can see quite a bit up here of what they did. So, uh, if you can see it, so up here, and we'll have a, we'll have a conversation in a little while about the, the policy of deportation, of deporting and, and uh, rehoming people in different countries. That's what you've got here. Um, families carrying their luggage and their possessions because they're expected to move to a new city um, and start living. And you can see that there. You've got the attack on the wall up the top here. This guy here apparently is fanning um, the door to the one of the doors um, that, he's, that he's put on, for, uh, that he's lit. Um, one of the, the gates. You've got this, the arches here with their shields up, sheltering them. 
here you've got some of the spoils, you've got the heads of some of the, um, the victims that they that put. There's obviously slaves that were taken away. Um, you've got this guy here, they had these protect these people that would come in and try and undermine the walls and chip away under the walls to try and undermine them. And obviously the, the ladders and the archers going up the ladders and the um, infantry behind who, who, um, who uh, provided some element of, of, of cover um, by, by laying down a cover of, of, of arrows while they climbed up. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, you can see, you know, that, that, that recollection that they, they had to, to show their people about the conquests that they, that they were doing. Um, and then this also is particularly barbaric. Uh, this was a um, Asher Nazipol re recalling his taking of a city called Tella. He said, I built a pillar over against the city gate and I flayed all the chiefs who had revolted and I covered the pillar with their skins. Some I impaled on the pillar of, on stakes and others I bound to stakes around the pillar. I cut the limbs off the officers who had rebelled. Many captives I burned with fire and many I took as living captives. From some I cut off their noses, their ears and their fingers. Of many I put out their eyes. I made one pillar of the living um, and another of heads and I bound their heads to tree trunks round about the city. The young men and maidens are consumed with fire. The rest of their warriors are consumed with thirst in the desert of the Euphrates. And so you can see this brand of violence that the Assyrians wanted to put out there and wanted to, you know, wanted to people to know them for. Because if you heard the Assyrians were coming, you know, what are you going to do? Are you going to say, no, nah, we can we can stick this out? Like when you know, you know what what they have done um, to uh, to other cities. Um, and news, that news would have travelled around. Like I said, you would have had refugees who, who had managed to escape cities um, as they were being attacked or prisoners who had managed to escape somehow and they're going south. They're not going, uh, they're not, you know, they're not in the north where, where, um, where the Assyrians are. They're going south down to Egypt to try and find somewhere, somewhere safe to stay. Um, and they would have talked about it when they're, when they're going down through the various, uh, various cities. I don't know, but I assume you still had merchants of some sort walk, walking, you know, going to, up and down the land, take, applying their trade. So they would have been talking about what they saw. I went past Lakeish and saw this stake of heads out the front. You know, you don't want to mess with those Assyrians um, unless you don't like your head. Um, and, and so that news would have circulated through the, through the country about um, this threat of the Assyrian Empire coming from the north. Um, and so, and, and we saw that tonight as well, actually. I won't, um, I won't get you to turn back because we're going to stay in Kings for a little bit. But that was that opening section about um, in Nahum 3. Now that you know that, maybe these words sort of make a bit of, um, make a bit more, mean a bit more. Um, Woe to the city of blood. It's full of lies and robberies. Its victim never departs. So there's an endless source, endless source of victims. The noise of a whip, the, the, the noise of rattling wheels, of galloping horses, of clatter, clattering chariots, horsemen, charged with bright sword and glittering spear. There's a multitude of slain, a great number of bodies, countless corpses. They stumble over the corpses. So, so those words in, in the, the opening of Nahum chapter three is exactly what, you know, is, is exactly the brand of violence that the Assyrians were known for. And so this is one of the reasons why God brings the, you know, it says it's, it's time to, this is, this is coming to an end. Um, so back in Israel, um, everyone potentially thinks that they got off uh, got off lightly. Um, they ducked down, potentially came down to Samaria, threatened them a bit, got some money out of them, um, and went back north. Uh, and so everyone believed, breathed a sigh of relief. The Assyrians have gone back. Hopefully they don't come any further south. But no, that is not what happened because we know in <coughs> chapter 15, Tiglath Pileser comes back five years later and around five years later. Uh, and takes the region of Galilee. So let's have a look in um, 2 Kings 15, verse uh, 29. Um, in the days of Pekah, king of, uh, king of Israel, Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, came and took um, Ijon, Abel Beth, Maker, Genoa, Kadesh, Hazor, Gilead, and Galilee, all the land of Naphtali, and he carried them captive to Assyria. So it didn't take them long to come back. Maybe the tribute wasn't enough. Maybe they had run out of slaves and that's why they took 
um, the inhabitants of the, these areas, the citizens of these cities back with them to Assyria. But for whatever reason, they came back down um, and, and they took over, uh, over these regions. And so suddenly the area of Galilee is gone. The area of Samaria potentially is still providing tribute, paying tribute um, through to the king of Assyria. Um, but clearly the plans the Assyrian army have to head south are uh, starting to come into play. Uh, and then it's only for another 15 years uh, before the next incursion further south occurs. So around 220 B, uh, 720 BC, we come to Second of Kings chapter 17. So if you turn over a page um, and we'll read verses three to six. Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, came up against him and Hoshea became his vassal and paid him tribute money. And the king of Assyria uncovered a conspiracy by Hoshea, for he had sent messengers to So, king of Egypt, and brought no tribute to the king of Assyria, as he had done year by year. Therefore the king of Assyria shut him up and put him in prison. Now the king of Assyria went throughout all the land and went up to Samaria and besieged it for three years. In the ninth year of Hoshea, king of Assyria, took, took Samaria and carried Israel away to Assyria, replaced them and placed them in Halah by the Habor, the river Gozan in the cities of the Medes. And over in verse 24, the king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Kutha, Ava, Hamath, and from Sephavaim, and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel. And they took possession of Samaria and dwelt in its cities. So Israel has gone. Galilee's gone. Um, Samaria's gone. Those northern tribes of Israel are now under the control um, of the Assyrian Empire and potentially a lot of them even removed. And this is the first reference that uh, we have here to this Assyria, uh, Assyrian policy of forced deportation and uh, resettlement. Israelites were put somewhere else, someone else was brought here. And there, it's interesting, there are a couple of different reasons why they did this. The most obvious one that I thought of at least um, was if you separate a people from their culture, from their homeland, from the temperature that they're used to, um, from, you know, uh, from their temples and from all of that, you let them take whatever they can, like we saw in the, in the fall of Thebes there, whatever they can on the back of a mule, um, you're, you're limiting it then to, to supplies basically and to, to your, your basic necessities. And so when you move them to a new environment and force them to confront, you know, to deal with, with where they're at, you increase your chance to try and break them and to assimilate them into, the new, into their new, this new identity um, that they, you know, that they have as a, as a, um, a uh, an Assyrian citizen, if you'd like to call it that. <clears throat> but also, um, apparently, that they did this um, with, like, it was uh, the, the government was involved to an extent on where people were placed because they would choose um, cities with particular strengths. Um, you know, maybe it's an agricultural based city, or maybe you know that's a strong. You know, they had a strong. I don't know. Um, blacksmithing industry or something like that, they might move them strategically around the empire to help build up the um, parts of the empire where the, where the, um, uh, where the agriculture wasn't work, you know, wasn't happening. And so there was a bit of strategy as well about where certain skilled groups of people or families or, or, or um, towns would be moved to, uh, to help the economic development of the empire. And Sargon II, um, talked <coughs> about this um, in, uh, in it. Um, let's check. Yeah, it was. So Shalmaneser and Sargon took the, the, re the region of, of Samaria. So um, that's, that's a bit of a... So the, the Sargon reference mainly comes from, from this cylinder where he wrote this. At the beginning of my royal rule, um, the town of the Samar Samarians I besieged uh, conquered uh, for the God who let me achieve this triumph. I led away as prisoners 27,000 and a bit inhabitants and equipped uh, from among them 
50 chariots for my royal corpse. The town I rebuilt after that, it was better than, I rebuilt better than it was before and settled therein people from countries which I had conquered. I placed an officer of mine as governor over them and imposed on them tribute as is customary for Assyrian citizens. Uh, and so we see there um, the, the, the reference to this forced, um, forced deportation resettlement policy uh, and um, Sargon II bragging about, about his uh, involvement or recording at least his involvement in this capture uh, and um, uh, basically destruction, I guess, to an extent of Samaria. But I thought it was also interesting, and I haven't researched enough on this, to note that um, the tribute was put on them as was customary for um, Assyrian citizens. It wasn't like we put tribute on them because they were prisoners of our almighty empire or something like that. Um, it reads to me as if you were expected to become a citizen of this new country that you'd been conquered by, and so you got the tax, the same tax that other Assyrian tax, you know, um, citizens got as well. Um, so, so that was um, what you know, what we, what we saw just here uh, in 2 Kings 17. Second uh, Kings 17. Um, and so then finally in 700 BC, the last at least attempt of a conquest of God's people uh, commences. And so this was Sennacherib coming down against Jerusalem. So if we turn over a page to 2 Kings 18, So, you know, Hezekiah would have, he was a good king. He would have known that they were coming at some point. When you've seen Galilee fall, when you've seen Samaria fall, uh, uh, you've seen Samaria fall, you've got to know as a good king, this is very likely to happen. You know, what am I going to do to prepare about it? Jerusalem has to be next in line, you know, with the capital um, of the area and so we've got to be be next in line and we know from second chronicles that he did know at some point he made that strategic decision to dig through dig the aqueduct so his city if it was besieged which was the um sumerian way of doing uh, was the assyrian way of doing things if it was besieged then they would have a water supply and they could continue to survive for an extent unless they found out where that water supply came from and did something about it um and so uh, we read in 2 Kings 18, verse 13, uh, in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. Uh, then Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria at Lachish, saying, I have done wrong. Turn away from me. Whatever you impose on me, I will pay. And the king of Assyria uh, assessed Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. So Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the house of Yahweh in the treasuries of the king's house. At that time, Hezekiah stripped the gold from the doors of the temple of Yahweh and from the pillars which Hezekiah, king of Judah, had overlaid uh, and gave them to the king of Assyria. And so we know that this occurred again, just if you needed confirmation, and I'm sure we all know about the Sennacherib prison, prism, uh, because he recorded the tribute as well. So as for Hezekiah, he wrote, in addition to the 30 talents of gold, so the 30 talents of gold um, was, was referenced here, um, 800 talents of silver, there were gems, jewels, large sandy stones, couches of ivory, house, chairs of ivory, elephant hide ivory, elephants, teeth, a few other things there, few female musicians, male and female musicians. He had uh, bring, bring after me to Nineveh, my royal city, to pay tribute and to accept servitude. He dispatched his messengers. So we've got this record that Sennacherib left. His story of the, uh, of the engagement, let's say, with Hezekiah at Jerusalem. Um, and there's no not surprisingly reference to um, the outcome of whether he invaded or whether he didn't invade um, uh, Jerusalem, because we know um, from uh, later on in chapter what is it, 22, maybe that uh, Yahweh's angel goes through, kills 180,000 of them. Um, and so they will return to Nineveh, um, minus the slaves, but with the booty that they managed to get out of Hezekiah. <clears throat> and so what we've seen is, the, is this expansion of the Assyrian Empire 
gradually over the top through the south of Turkey, down the coast of the, the Mediterranean coast and, and, and down further into uh, and to eventually take take out most of um, the uh, most of most of the Israeli territory. Um, and so we can get a picture of, of, of this build up to Naam's prophecy. Now that, like I said, that this, this conquest down, uh, conquest attempt down to um, uh, Jerusalem was in 700 BC, but we know the bookends are still a bit further on from there. But this is, this is the build up. This is what, this is what's happening in Israel, in, in, in the, you know, in the region. Israel has gone into captivity. Judah is only left. Judah has the pressure um, of what's going to happen. Um, is, is Nineveh, is Assyria going to come down again? You know, yes, they went back after 180,000 people died, 180,000 soldiers, but are they going to come back again? You know, who knows if they're going to come back again? Um, and so uh, Judah still has this fear of, of what might happen. So um, this, this is what's, what's led to, uh, led in the build up to the prophecy taking place. Now, the spoil that they took from uh, these, from the tribute that came in, um, and I'm actually missing a page of notes, so I'm winging it from here. <clears throat> um, the spoil that they took from the uh, from the countries that and the cities they invaded, um, and the, the the slave labor that they got as well, um, was what was underpinned the the growth and the beauty of this city of Nineveh. So this is an artist's impression of what um, Nineveh possibly looked like. Um, there are still remains of Nineveh uh, around today. Um, it's uh, just outside Mosul in Iraq, if you want to go and check it out. It's an easy place to get to, I'm sure. Um, and so uh, very, very beautiful. It was known significantly for um, the amount of water that they managed to get into the city. So they had a, a large number of aqueducts that were built, um, and we'll have a look at some of those in a minute, uh, which helped move water around the, the country, um, which is obviously a, a, a dry country, not in this particular spot. Um, but uh, Sennacherib undertook a, a massive expansion. Maybe that was um, what happened when he left um, after getting decimated at uh, Jerusalem. He went back to Nineveh and took, undertook a massive program of capital works in Nineveh and turned it into its, its um, you know, its, it's, I think the Wikipedia reference calls it like basically like peak Nineveh. It didn't get any better than what it was like when Sennacherib's building um, <clears throat> capital works program took place. Um, there was the, the there's, there's speculation about whether the um, hanging gardens of Babylon were influenced by Sennacherib's hanging gardens. He had so much water that came in that allowed them to, um, that, that allowed them to put up all sorts of, um, of plants and uh, plant life. I can't think of the general expression for it around the city. Um, he, he demolished a lot of buildings, made significantly wide plazas, built lots of temples, temples to the gods of the cities they, conquest, uh, they, they conquered uh, and turned it into something that must have been a real eye-opener for any of the poor Jewish um, citizens that might have been dragged off to Nineveh being taken to, to the big smoke. It's like taking someone from, I don't know, Coolgardie to New York, I guess, that sort of equivalent. On, uh, it would have just been incredible for them. Um, and so this is the uh, sort of aqueduct that they, uh, that they built to, to move water around. You can see in that bottom artist uh, impression of how they work. That's the, the ruins up the top, which, uh, which was part of the original aqueduct. And so this way they were able to move water around and were able to, um, you know, able to um, irrigate a lot of area that otherwise would have uh, been too difficult to irrigate. Um, and uh, like I said before, the fascination with, with documenting and, 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 and recording the, the different things that took place, um, they, have, they had the, the largest library that was uh, ever um, that had been found. Uh, these are a few of the types of uh, books, let's call them, that came out of the library. So one of the cool things that they did was they shaped the, uh, so they had rooms based on different topics. Um, and that was everything from agriculture to finance to the languages of the different countries. And they shaped the, um, the tablets in a certain shape. So I think off the top of my head, um, the, all the financial based records were the round records. But then you'd have maybe the agricultural ones with a small 
um, you know, the small squares and the large rectangles were language and, and based on the topic is what they, is what they, uh, they shaped their tablets into. Um, and, but they were just fascinated with making sure they documented, uh, they documented things. And so you can see from, from these images um, and from, from this bit of history, like the expansionist element to it, but also that indulgent, self-indulgent attitude that was, uh, was present in Nineveh around the time that, uh, that Nahum, Nahum would have started writing. It was a city that was so beautiful, a, a country that was so rich that had established itself well and truly to everybody that was under their control, um, established themselves well and truly uh, and would be seen as a country that was never going to change. It was never like who is ever going to defeat this, this country. Nineveh is huge. The army is incredible. They are, they are barbaric and violent. It, this is here to stay. But Nahum's prophecy comes in, um, which we'll start to see from next week and says uh, that's actually not going to be the case. Um, this violence is going to go. This lying, this bloodshed, this exploitation of the poor, um, all for the gain of the Assyrian population and the glory of the Assyrian kings has gone too far. Uh, and so that's where we'll pick it up from next week. Thank you very much for that, Vin. Um, you know, I certainly found it fascinating. I always get a kick out of um, history, historical events, and how they can document the, the truth of the Bible or the accuracy of the Bible. And so we look forward to the next two sessions on Nahum. Um, I, I didn't check what's on next week um if anybody happens to know or else i can talk back a bit. Uh, so next week is a combined class 25th of may all right, so we won't be in the hall necessarily. All right, so we can um, conclude our evening together with uh, singing of hymn number 311 and then prayer. <laughs>
Loving most gracious Heavenly Father, we approach before you once again at the conclusion of this class to give you thank the thanks that is due to you for all that you do for us. We thank you for the treat we've had this evening of the exposition of thy word, where we see how that those events that are documented in your word are amply supported by the evidence we see around us. And so the veracity of that word cannot be questioned. <clears throat> we do pray, Heavenly Father, for that main prophecy, which is from your word, which is the return of your son back to this earth. We see all the troubles in the world about us and the troubles that we're experiencing in our lives. And we long for that time when all those troubles will be turned into joy. And to that end, Heavenly Father, we pray that your blessing will be upon those in our midst who are suffering and in need of your care. May you be with them and bring them back to health if it is your will. We pray also for your people, Israel, which we have just considered and just sung about, in that you have brought them back to your land, but Heavenly Father, they, they live in ignorance of you. And so we pray for that time when they will be turned around and reunited with your son, their saviour. And so we thank you also for the many blessings you give us in this life, including the supper and the loving hands that have provided it. And so we thank you for all these things and seek your blessing upon us as we go away. We approach you now and through your son, our redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm.